So today's topic is sequencing BCMA myeloma therapies. And Dr. Richter gave me a preview of what his presentation is going to be like, and I'm just so excited. He goes into detail for those of you who are unfamiliar about what BCMA might be, and then what are the therapies that we have today in myeloma that are targeting BCMA, and then what has early clinical trial data taught us. So I'm really looking forward to you guys learning with me. This is an important topic. We see that we have 400 people registered for today's meeting. People are wondering about all of these therapies, how they fit together to most effectively treat myeloma. And as I mentioned in the event description, and as I've mentioned before, we don't have all the answers today, but I want to give you as much information as we can give you about this topic. And that's why it's so important that you're here today. You're either here live or watching the recording and you can learn more about these myeloma treatments that are affecting um, our pathway towards a cure. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richter to you. He's an associate professor of medicine in the Tisch Institute Division of Hematology and Medical Oncology. He's the director of multiple myeloma at the Blavatnik Family Chelsea Medical Center at Mount Sinai. Dr. Richter treats patients with plasma cell dyscrasias, including multiple myeloma and related diseases, such as AL amyloidosis, plasma cell leukemia, and Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Dr. Richter has extensive experience with clinical trials focused on novel therapies, including antibody therapy and immunotherapy, which is what we're talking about today, for a precision medicine approach. He has been published extensively on these topics and has been invited to speak regionally, nationally, and also internationally. He has been published in journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine, Blood, and the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Dr. Rector, we feel privileged that you take the time to be here with us today. Thank you, and we look forward to your awesome presentation. Wow, thank you for that introduction. Um, really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who's tuning in. Uh, you know, it's one of the most amazing things about myeloma is the advocacy, the patient involvement. Uh, it's really great to see. So let me pray technology is working. Let me share some screens and let's see what we got. Can I get a thumbs up? Or are we good? All right, let's 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 start. So um, I will fully admit this is a little bit of clickbait. Um, BCMA therapies are amazing and they're really, really good and exactly how to sequence them, where they fit in the myeloma paradigm, we don't really know just yet. Uh, we have some really fascinating data that's out so far, some really cool stuff that's gonna be presented at meetings in the next few months. So we're really starting to learn about this. So I will, I will kind of reveal that I don't have the answer, but I will share what we know so far. So let's, oh, here we go. Let's kind of start off with where we're at at the moment. And one of the things that we talk about in myeloma uh, is kind of the three main classes of drugs. Uh, and these three main classes are drugs that most people will see uh, as part of their first, uh, certainly by their second line of treatment. These are drugs like the IMIDs, the immunomodulatory drugs. These are all derivatives of thalidomide. So uh, thalidomide, lenalidomide, which is Revlimid, and pomalidomide, which is pomalist. Then we have the proteasome inhibitors. These are drugs like bortezomib, also known as Velcade, carfilzomib, also known as Kyprolis, and exazomib, also known as Nenlaro. Excuse me, already messing things up. All right, and the CD38 monoclonal antibodies. So just as our body makes antibodies to fight infection, we actually have engineered drugs that are antibodies that target the myeloma. These are drugs like daratumumab, which is Darzalex, and Isatuximab, which is Sarclisa. And these have been the three main classes of drugs across the last decade that we've used for newly diagnosed patients and patients where the myeloma has come back. And this kind of dizzying slide shows some of you know, the latest and greatest. And you know, we have the classic chemo drugs like melphalan and cyclophosphamide, very old school drugs that still have an important role to play in a number of settings. Um, we've lost a couple of drugs across the last year uh, and a half. We've lost panabinostat, uh, which is no longer FDA approved. We've lost a drug called melflufen, which is no longer FDA approved. And we've lost uh, one of our first BCMA therapies in myeloma, uh, belantamab mafodotin. It's an antibody drug conjugate. So it's kind of like an antibody drug like daratumumab, and then a chemo drug 
like melphalan or cyclophosphamide, but the problem with systemic chemo is that it goes everywhere. The wonderful thing about antibody drug conjugates, it's like an antibody with a warhead. So it takes the regular chemo, attaches onto the myeloma cell and injects the poison, hopefully limiting the side effects uh, when doing it this way and maximizing the efficacy. This drug is currently off the market as of November 22nd of last year, but we'll talk about how it hopefully will be coming back next year. Um, we have the new generation of IMID, so the new generation of Revlimid and Pomalist uh, coming along, which will hopefully be approved in the coming years. But what has really become the big exciting thing is drugs targeting BCMA or B cell maturation antigen. BCMA is a target that's on all myeloma cells. And it turns out that regular antibodies, so we call naked antibodies like Darzalex and Sarclisa, naked antibodies against BCMA don't really do anything. You either have to attack them with an antibody drug conjugate, so have a warhead along the way, or you can use a bispecific antibody, so a two-headed antibody, one arm that grabs onto that BCMA and the other that grabs onto your T cells, which are your immune cells that help fight viruses, bacteria, and cancer and activate them to attack the myeloma, or use a CAR-T where we collect your T cells, just like we collect cells when we collected them for a stem cell transplant, except we adjust the dial on the machine. And instead of collecting stem cells, we collect your T cells and in the lab, rev them up to all attack the myeloma and infuse them back into you. So right now, bispecifics and CAR-T are really the main ways that we attack myeloma. And this is really a brand new concept, uh, not a brand new concept, but this is an exciting new day in myeloma. You know, if we really think back to what the original chemo was, original chemo just kind of killed indiscriminately. You killed the good and you killed the bad. So it, it wasn't really the optimal way of doing things. And with the next generation of drugs, the targeted or novel agents like Revlimid and Darzalex and Velcade, you know, they were good at focusing more on the bad stuff. But what we're really at in the new age of myeloma therapy is saying, well, the best cancer fighter in the world is our own immune system. The reality is that everyone makes cancer, cell, cancer cells 24 hours a day. The reason why many people don't get cancer or the cancer doesn't progress or it stays at very tiny levels is our own immune system holds it under control. Well, what if we can harness that? And instead of just smashing everything down, what if we could figure out ways to boost our own immune system to attack the myeloma? And that's what these T cell redirectors are and we call bispecific antibodies and CAR T cells, T cell redirectors. So the first one, and there's gonna be a lot of data with a lot of numbers, but I'll really, it's just as a reference, we'll talk about the big concepts. So these are the kind of latest and greatest in BCMA targeted bispecifics. Bispecific antibodies are great because they're off the shelf. CAR T's right now take time to manufacture. You have to collect the cells. You have to ship them off. They can take four to eight weeks to manufacture. There are new technologies trying to manufacture them much quicker, but at the moment it takes a while. These are off the shelf, which means theoretically, if I saw you in the morning and I knew your disease was crazy out of control, I could theoretically give this to you by the afternoon. We're not quite there just yet uh, because there's some logistics, but essentially you could. And right now we have one FDA approved, teclistamab, also known as Tecveli. Uh, and this is an already approved BCMA targeted uh, bispecific antibody, which is highly effective in myeloma. Uh, the second Elranatumab has been filed with the FDA. We're hoping to see its approval prior to probably the uh, late summer, early fall. Uh, ABBV383 and alnuctumab are a little farther behind, and lymvaceltumab, fingers crossed, will be filed to the FDA this year. So really, this started with teclistamab, and this was our first-in-class bispecific antibody, recently approved, available at a myeloma center near you. Uh, this is given in a subcutaneous version, so it's only a little pinch. Uh, as opposed to a longer IV. Because it can activate your immune system, you need to be admitted to the hospital for the first week so that as we up titrate the drug and your immune system gets really, really revved up, we make sure it doesn't get too revved up. Myeloma is just like everything in life. Goldilocks. Goldilocks is what we want. The earth is in the Goldilocks zone. You know, it's not too close to the sun where it's too hot. It's not too far away. It's too cold. We want a Goldilocks amount of immune activation. Too little and it doesn't attack the cancer. Too much and it can cause other side effects. 
like cytokine release syndrome or CRS or eye cans or other problems. We want the Goldilocks amount. And that's why we admit you to the hospital to thread that needle. Um, and this drug so far has shown response rates in patients who've had many, many other lines of therapy of 63% when used after everything else. Uh, it's given once a week, uh, continuously, so until progression or intolerability, but there is data that's going to be presented at this year's ASHSCO and EHA uh, Congresses. We're looking at spacing out the drug to every two weeks and soon maybe to every four. And there'll probably be some people that we just stop all together and monitor them off of therapy. Elranatumab is the second drug uh, bispecific antibody, uh, sorry, second BCMA bispecific antibody that's in front of the FDA. There's a non-BCMA bispecific called talquetamab, which is currently being reviewed. Elranatumab is a similar type of drug uh, to teclistamab, and its, base, its data was based off of the Magnetism 1 study. And this is what we call a swimmer's plot. And you kind of imagine looking overhead, and these are lanes of uh, people swimming. And we can see a similar response rate in heavily pretreated patients, 64%. Now, that may not seem that amazing, but if you look at the last decade of prior approvals, when Pomalis was given by itself, Kyprolis, even when Dara or Selenex or any of those drugs were approved by the FDA, they actually had a response rate at the end of the road with just by itself between 22 and 30%. The fact that this by itself is getting us 65% is quite amazing. And it's durable. The median duration of remission is around 17 months. And some people staying in remission for very long periods of time on Elranatumab. Now, with all these drugs, because we're redirecting T cells, so T cells that are here to fight cancer, but also bacteria and viruses, we're saying, hey, guys, come over here. Cancer is the main problem. There's not necessarily people minding the store. So it puts you at risk for things like infections. And we're starting to give medicines, prophylactic antibiotics, antivirals, and something called IVIG, intravenous immune globulin, to help prevent against infections when we give these drugs. Uh, we do admit you for that first step up to make sure you don't have your immune system get so crazy uh, that we call cytokine release syndrome. Cytokines are chemicals that cells send between each other. So when we activate the T cells, they say, hey, you T cells over there, come on, we're going to go fight the cancer. And those chemical levels go up and you can have fevers, fast heart rate, low blood pressure. We have antidotes for this, but that's why we want to make sure everyone is safe in the first step up dosing. So what are we starting to do with these? We're starting to combine them with our other drugs. So the Majestic 2 study is combining teclistamab with drugs like daratumumab and lenalidomide, which is Revlimid. And again, those response rates are starting to shoot up. So when we're using this drug earlier, so we're sequencing the BCMA drug, not at the end of the road, but in the early relapse setting and combining it with other medicines, we see an overall response rate here of 93.5%. Now, let's shift gears for a moment to the currently FDA-approved CAR T-cells. We currently have two that are FDA-approved. Uh, one is called Ida-Captagene Veclusal, also known as Idacel or Abecma. Uh, and then the second one is Siltacaptagene Autolusal, also known as Siltacel, also known as Carvicti. Uh, now, these are both studied in patients who've had lots and lots and lots of other lines of therapy, all the standard stuff and still have response rates of 80 to over 97%. So where are we going with these? Well, there, a study was just published a, a few days ago um, called the KARMA-3 study. And the KARMA-3 study said, well, when the disease comes back in the early settings, should we give you a CAR-T or should we give you what we give everyone, daratumumab plus pomalidomide or something like that. And so far, this data has shown that giving a CAR-T seems to be better than the other stuff in early relapse. So now we're starting to sequence the CAR-T cell therapy earlier on in our paradigm. So right now it's standard treatment. And then when the disease first comes back, we're hoping that this study called KARMA-3 and another study called CARTITUDE-4 which is the same kind of approach using Carvicti, which again will be uh, um, presented uh, in May and June. We're hoping that these studies will help the FDA say, CAR-Ts are not just for people who've had everything. They belong earlier on in our paradigm. 
And we have more data to back this up. So this was a study called CARTITUDE 2. Sorry, I didn't make up the names. But this looked at patients who had early relapse. So we gave them the standard therapy, but the disease came back much quicker than we expect. So we gave them a CAR-T. What did the response rates look like? My favorite thing to say, 100%, right there in the middle. This is an amazing concept. Being able to sit down with someone and when they say, so do you think this will work? Well, so far, this approach has had a 100% response rate. So very exciting stuff. And it may be that CAR T cells are not optimal at the end of the road. We may need to start giving them an early relapse or maybe the first time the disease comes back, we should be giving a CAR T. There are ongoing studies looking at what happens if we move it all the way to frontline. We do CAR T versus a stem cell transplant. That study is ongoing. Or we give you a transplant and after that we give you a CAR T. That study is ongoing. Too soon yet to say anything about it. And now in the last few minutes, really kind of getting to the clickbait. And I apologize for calling it, calling it clickbait. But how do we sequence these? Some people got Blenrep, the BCMA by, um, antibody drug conjugate. And now we have two FDA approved BCMA targeting CAR T cells, one BCMA approved by specific and probably a second, if not a third before the end of the year. Can you get one after the other? The short answer is yes, you can. So the mechanisms of resistance of a lot of these therapies is not what we call antigen loss. I'll explain what that means. So BCMA, that marker that sticks up on myeloma cells, we call that an antigen. An antigen uh, clicks up with an antibody. That's how they attack, attach onto the, the cells. Well, sometimes when we give these therapies, the reason why it stops working is the cell says, uh -uh, I'm not gonna stick that flag up anymore. I'll pull it inside and I'm no longer going to express BCMA. Um, and that's how we used to think that was the main mechanism of resistance. And that probably plays some role, but that's not the whole story. And cells don't necessarily lose that. Part of the reason why people progress on these treatments is the T cells that you're activating, they get exhausted. It's Friday. They've been working all week. They need a break. So our current strategies, apart from looking at how to increase BCMA on the surface, is looking to see how can we reinvigorate the T cells. So just because you had a BCMA therapy doesn't mean you can't get another one. Again, most of these trials that were done excluded you if you had a prior BCMA, but these here allowed it. And we can see response rates. And again, they run the gamut from the 50s and 60% to much higher response rate. And even with l the drug that's currently in front of the FDA, small number of patients, but more than half had a prior BCMA and then responded. So you can give sequential BCMA therapy. How do you do it? Should you give a CAR-T and then a bispecific or a bispecific then a CAR-T? It doesn't matter. And the short answer is we don't really know. However, there is some really great data. And again, hot off the presses uh, from Dr. Cohen uh, over at UPenn and a number of other international collaborators about looking at siltacel and what happens about giving siltacel in someone who's already had another BCMA targeted agents. Now, the two are the ADC, which in this case is Blenrep. So people had Blenrep and then had Carvicti, or they had a bispecific. And there's a number of the bispecifics that target BCMA. And so far, you can see that we still had great response rates. Yes, they seem to be a little bit lower than those who had not had a prior BCMA. So it's not perfect, but you can still get great and durable responses. And here we saw for the full cohort of patients that had prior BCMA, overall response rate of 60%, median duration response of about a year, uh, and a number of them getting those really, really deep responses like MRD negativity. Are there things that separate out those who respond to a second BCMA versus uh, those that don't? Part of it has to do with the duration of your last tr BCMA treatment and the time from it. So it, the non-responders seem to be um, on their last BCMA longer, which may just mean that they were on that bispecific for so long that the T cells really, really got exhausted. And that was the main reason why you progressed. And then the T cells were not quite fit enough to work as well as we needed when we needed the BCMA CAR T. But 
uh, a time from the last BCMA uh, therapy has a role. So if you had a CAR T a year ago or two years ago, and now you're relapsing, now's probably a time where you could use another one and expect a really good response. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, so we don't have it all answered just yet, but the short answer is that you can get a BCMA bispecific or an antibody drug conjugate, and then you can get a CAR T and you can respond. So conclusions, BCMA targets are very active. Again, in drugs where we used to get, you know, the standard myeloma was 20 to 30% response rate at the end of the line, BCMA is giving us 60 to 97%. And when we move it up to first relapse, we're getting 90 to 100%. What happens when we move this up to the front? We don't know. How do we optimize them? Do we combine them with other therapies? Uh, do we sequence them? Should you get a bispecific as a maintenance after a CAR T? Should you only get a CAR T if you have residual disease after a transplant? All of these are ongoing studies. We're going to answer them. The KARMA 3 and CARTITUDE 4 studies are comparing early relapse getting standard daratumumab-based therapy versus a CAR-T. CAR-T seems to be winning. We're crossing fingers. We have not seen the CARTITUDE-4 data. We're going to see it at ASCO or EHA. Very excited to see that. Should CAR-T be part of the upfront therapy? Is there a magical Rubik's Cube solution of DARA-VRD transplant CAR-T, and then you're cured? We're hoping that one of these combinations is the answer to that. Belantamab is gone for the moment. Based on the DREAM3 study, the FDA and GSK pulled the drug off the market on November 22nd, 2023. However, there are two ongoing studies, the DREAM7 and DREAM8 study. DREAM7 is a head-to-head, -head, daratumumab, pomalidomide, dexamethasone versus belantamab, pomalidomide, dexamethasone. And DREAM8 is pomalidomide, velcade, dexamethasone versus belantamab, pomalidomide. And we're really hoping that one, if not both, will read out maybe towards the end of the year. And if one of them reads out positive, we can go back to the FDA and try to get this drug back in our armamentarium. Now, the other thing about sequencing is we have non-BCMA T-cell redirection therapy. So we have a target called GPRC5D, which is another target on all myeloma cells. We have talquetamab, which is a GPRC5D bispecific, which is in front of the FDA, hopefully approved later this summer. There are also ongoing studies with GPRC5D CAR T cells. Early data, extremely encouraging. A lot of the great work being done here uh, with Dr. Adriana Rossi um, at Sloan Kettering with Dr. Sham Malincotti uh, and at the Dana Farber with Eric Smith. And we have FCRH5, another target on myeloma cells. We have a bispecific called Savastamab, uh, which I'm leading the efforts for here at Mount Sinai, having some amazing uh, results. In fact, we just opened the CAMA2 study, which specifically looks at Savastamab on people progressing after a BCMA therapy. So we're starting to fill in the gaps of exactly how to sequence everything. And with that, I will stop and take any and all questions. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Richter. You really did a great job of answering a lot of the common questions that we get of telling us what the future might hold. So I do appreciate you kind of anticipating those questions and answering them. Um, lots of questions coming in right now, but I encourage those to continue to come as we will be asking as many as possible today. Um, one of the questions, oh, and it looks like I forgot to turn off the raise hand. So just so you know, we're going to do all of our questions through the question and answers. We're not going to have um, hands raised today just because of the amount of people that are here. So um, you anticipated this question, but let's talk about it a little bit. So we talked about how, you know, at the very end is when they're kind of reserving this BCMA targeted therapy. But we see it moving up and up and up in clinical trials. Your personal philosophy, do you see or do you anticipate these bispecifics and CAR-T becoming standard of care in front therapy? Or is it just too early to really tell? Um, it is too early to say. I can make my predictions of what I think is likely to happen. So CAR-T have to be done in academic centers. Um, and although a lot of people on calls like this have 
either all or some of their therapy or some of their care at a myeloma center, it turns out that 80% of all myeloma in the United States is in communities. So this is wonderful, but community docs, you know, you have a one or two person practice, they can't give CAR Ts. So until we start proving cure or near cure, the number of people who get CAR Ts is still relatively low. And, you know, upfront therapy with myeloma is so great it's a high bar to get on top of. So I'm not so sure that CAR T is going to get there, but it very well might. Biospecifics, yeah. on the other hand, I think have a really high potential to get there. The two caveats I will say about that is one, right now we still collect stem cells when we want to do a transplant. We have no data about someone who gets a BCMA therapy and then we try to collect stem cells. We may or may not be able to collect them. It turns out that daratumumab impairs our ability to collect stem cells. It doesn't cancel it out, but it makes it harder. And some people, we have a little trouble. What happens when we give a BCMA first? I don't know. But what I think is likely to be an option in the future is a drug like teclistamab or linvaseltamab, one of these BCMA uh, bispecifics, plus what we call a cell mod. Cell mods are the next generation imids, the next generation Revlimid or pomalist. So specifically a drug called ibertamide, which is hopefully going to work its way towards the front line, kind of like Revlimid, but a little more potent and less in the way of lowering the blood counts. You could see a space where someone gets a bispecific and a cell mod, and that's their induction. And then at some point you stop the bispecific and stay on the cell mod as a maintenance. It wouldn't surprise me if five to 10 years from now, that was an approach. Yeah, definitely. It's so exciting to be able to have these conversations. It's really the next generation of myeloma therapies improved on what we had before, you know, and it's just, it wouldn't have been possible to get here without all of the therapies that had come before. So it's just really exciting to see the progress and know that there's so much hope in the world of myeloma. Um, let's talk a little bit about bispecifics. The world with more real world data, of how people are responding to bispecifics and these side effects, do you always see a period of hospitalization in the beginning, or do you think eventually it will just be truly off the shelf and available in pharmacies? Wonderful question. Um, so yes, uh, the drug is absolutely headed to outpatient only. The question is, how do you get there? And there's two ways to do it. One is risk stratification. And we're starting to develop models to figure out who is going to get CRS mm. or the bad side effects. And there are some people trying to create these scoring systems. And part of the things that we put in there is how old are you? So, or how fit are you? How well would you tolerate if you had this at home? What your disease burden is. It turns out that the more disease you have going into these therapies, the higher the likelihood of CRS. So if we catch you relapsing, but the disease is still kind of low, you're probably not going to get it. So part of it is risk stratification. The other is some wonderful work that's being done to prevent CRS. So when someone gets it in the hospital, the first thing we almost always grab for is a drug called tocilizumab. Tocilizumab is an anti-IL-6 drug. IL-6 is one of those uh, cytokines, one of those chemicals that we send. And the idea is cut the strings, shut down those signals. Then we give tocilizumab, it works. There are several studies looking at giving prophylactic tocilizumab mm -hmm. before you get the bispecific. So uh, this was presented recently by one of our colleagues up in Canada, Suzanne Trudell, with the Savastamab drug. And when they gave tocilizumab ahead of it, the CRS rates dropped from over 90% to around 37%. There are several studies underway looking at giving prophylactic tocilizumab prior to, to, uh, to prophylactic tosi prior to clistamab. So you could see a world not so far from now where if you're healthy enough, so we're not really, really worried about you as much, you have a lower disease burden and we give you prophylactic, we can shift this all out patient. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, we talked a lot about CAR or CAR VICD, CAR T today, and I know that necessarily wasn't on purpose, but there are some questions about, you know, if I have a BECMA, does it still apply that I can have continued by specific or other immunotherapies? Yeah, so if you have a BECMA um, and you relapse, uh, unfortunately, um, yeah, you can get other immunotherapies. So again, what probably predicts is how long ago, if you had a BECMA a year or two ago, 
I would come right in with another BCMA therapy like teclistamab. If you just had a Beckman, and a few months later, the disease is coming back, BCMA may not be the next best approach. That's why right now we're really looking at mostly what we call the non-BCMA T-cell redirectors that target that GPRC5D or FCRH5. That being said, you can, if there's if there aren't those available, you can get to clistamab. And we are seeing responses in people that go from one to the other. So there's a lot of great ways to get around that. Yeah, definitely. Um, BCMA is expressed on other cells besides myeloma cells, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that the same for GPRC5D? It's a great question. Um, yes. So whenever we talk about these antigens, you know, the optimal target is something that's only on the cancer cell and on nothing else. So BCMA, as the name might imply, is first of all on some regular healthy plasma cells, but also on some of your regular B cells. And because of that, one of the main side effects is immune suppression and risk for infections, because you're not just killing, you're mostly killing the bad stuff, but you're also killing some good stuff along the way. GPRC5D, and it's such a mouthful, <laughs> is not really expressed so much in other B cells. And as such, the infection rates with GPRC5D are lower. But GPRC5D is expressed on a few other tissues that BCMA is not. So GPRC5D is expressed on the palms of the hands and the soles of your feet. So one of the side effects is you can get this, what we call a desquamating rash, basically you get a little sloughing, um, but you can use emollients and creams and that will go away. It's also expressed in the lining of the GI tract and salivary glands. So some people get what we term dysgeusia, which means that food doesn't taste just right. You may not want to eat. And we're looking at ways to counteract that as well. Awesome. This is absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Sure. Speaking of side effects, uh, Stephanie asked a great question. Having uh, I can't, Blenrep, I can't, Balantamab Mafidotin. Mafidotin. <laughs> <laughs> it has um, issues with uh, ocular issues. Mm -hmm. Is that true of any of the other immunotherapies that we discussed today? Is it a common side effect? No, it turns out that uh, it's really more related to the payload, the toxin rather than the BCMA. Um, and what happens is that drug can get micro cysts, tiny little cysts that come on the cornea um, and it can cause blurry vision and things like that. And once you stop the drug, essentially 100% of the time that goes away. Um, there was another drug that was in development called Medi-2228, which was a similar antibody drug conjugate like Belantamab that had similar toxicities, but we're not seeing that with any of the BCMA bispecifics or the BCMA CAR-Ts. Encouraging. Thank you. Here's a good question of a patient who's worried about how immunocompromised they really might be after a bispecific therapy. What is the common quality of life that you see in your patients that have received these? And are serious infections a big concern? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a lot to unpack here. And this is really one of the most important questions that's in myeloma at the current time. So let's start off with quality of life, because quality of life has to bubble to the top for this. A lot of the patients on these drugs, because the day-to-day -day toxicity is not really there, it's not like they necessarily get fatigue like people do with IMIDs or neuropathy with Velcade. Many patients have a great quality of life. They feel generally well, but what can really stymie your quality of life is a big infection or worse yet, an admission to the hospital. So um, those are major concerns. So there are ways that we're combating this. One is prophylactic intravenous immune globulin, so healthy IgG. We're preventing some of the uh, infections. So pneumocystis pneumonia, which was something we used to see in myeloma patients. We used to give tons of steroids, even more than we do now. It's seen in patients who have AIDS because their T cells are really low. Now that we're redirecting the T cells, we're starting to see things like PCP again. We're prophylaxing against that by giving medication and preventing things like shingles. We're also doing monitoring for other viruses to make sure they don't pop up. So it's really about being extra, getting a drug like this with a center that's given it a bit, because instead of just throwing a drug at it, there's a lot of nuts and bolts that have to be put together to optimize how you do, how you tolerate it, and quality of life. So infections are real. 
Um, but there are ways to mitigate that as much as possible. The biggest one is probably stopping treatment once you achieve a certain depth of response. So right now, teclizumab is approved. You just continue it. There's a general consensus in myeloma. I can't say everyone because not all myeloma doctors agree on anything. But yeah. most of us feel that that's only for now. The right answer is probably give it until you get your best response, maybe a little extra, then stop it for two reasons. One, if you keep giving it when you don't need to, your T cells will get exhausted. And when the disease starts bubbling up, they may be too tired to fight. So give them a break. The second is to allow your normal immune system to recover to reduce the incidence of infection. So the future is likely we give it continuously and then we stop it. Yeah, definitely. You bring up two really great points. One is to have uh, a care team that takes care of you, you know, to be in partnership with your care team. As if this is something that you're worried about, making sure that your physicians, your nurses, your GP, everybody is on the same page and that you know which symptoms to report, just having the best care possible. And the second is there are so many answers that we're on the cusp of knowing and without clinical trial participation, we wouldn't get there and just how invaluable it is that people are willing to participate in these kind of clinical trials and even real world data of people that are willing to get these unfamiliar um, medications in the clinic so that we can get these answers that are going to really affect, you know, the, really the next generation and next generation of, of myeloma patients. So thank you. Sure. Um, a couple questions here. There's some confusion on who is a candidate for CAR-T in today's myeloma. So if you wouldn't mind briefly explaining who um, is a CAR-T candidate and when that occurs in my sure. treatment. Absolutely. So right now we have to follow what's called the FDA label. And the FDA label for both the two FDA approved CAR T cells, both Abecma and Carvicti, is a myeloma patient who's had at least four prior lines of therapy. So first of all, what is a line of therapy? A line of therapy is a treatment path that you receive that you tolerate and don't progress on. If you don't tolerate it and you switch to something else, that's a new line of therapy. If your disease gets worse, that's a new line of therapy. But induction, consolidation, transplant, post-transplant consolidation, maintenance, that's one line of planned therapy. So if you get DARA RVD and a transplant, some more RVD and then Revlimid maintenance, even though that's four different things, that's only one line of therapy. If you then progress on it and get DARA POM index, that's your second. If you then progress on and get carfilzomib cytox index, that's your third. If you then progress on that and get solenexor, velk, dexamethasone, that's your fourth, and then you're eligible. Um, this is ridiculous. And thankfully, there are many advocacy groups like the International Myeloma Foundation and the International Myeloma Foundation and the FDA had this big meeting in Bethesda last year, which I was lucky enough to be at and speak at a little bit, um, to try to get the FDA to understand that we need to stop approving drugs this way, that there's difference. Four lines of therapy is different if you get Revlimid and then Velcade and then Darzola. If you get all the drugs sequentially, that's different than someone who gets Dara RVD all up front. And then in their next line, that's a different person. So we're trying to change this gestalt. And so it's really what drugs have you seen, not what line. So you have to have at least four prior lines. The rest of it then is institutional based on two things. One, slot availability. Right now, there's a limited number of commercially available CAR T's. So we can't give it to everyone, although because last year teclistamab was approved and we took a lot of people on that list and gave them teclistamab, our site and many others, the CAR T waiting list shrunk overnight. So it's a lot easier to get it right now. The third is, are you young and healthy enough? And I hate saying that, but you can think of extremes. If someone is 100 years old and just had quadruple bypass surgery, probably not the best candidate for this. So it's really up to your care team to decide with you, is this appropriate medically? Is a slot available? And do you fill the current FDA approval? But again, between the CARMA-3 and CARTITUDE-4 studies, we're hoping pretty soon 
the FDA may say you only had to have one prior line of therapy. Oh, you're on mute. Um, that would be a game changer. So fingers crossed. Um, there was one uh, follow-up question to that. Do you have to have evidence of disease in order to qualify for a CAR-T? So that is a wonderful question. So um, many patients uh, or most patients with myeloma have what we call measurable disease, where you make an M spike or a bad protein in the blood or an M spike in the urine or your free light chain. Um, some myeloma patients don't make any, and we call them non-secretory. Non-secretory patients are often excluded from clinical trials because there's no agreed upon standard way to follow them, which is silly, but that's the way they do them. Uh, but you don't, you can be non-secretory and get a commercial CAR-T. Even more so, you can have had your fourth line and be in remission and get the CAR-T. You don't have to be progressing per se. So you can either have low amounts of disease because you've had your four lines, your CAR-T is ready to go. We don't have to wait until things get bad. Or you can be one of the minority of people that don't make that bad protein. We can't measure it and we can give you a commercial one. So you don't have to have measurable disease to get the CAR-T commercially. Super exciting. Thank you. Um, Michael had a question here. If we're going to start doing stored T cell collection, similar to what we do for stem cell transplants. Um, phenomenal question. Um, and I will answer that in two different ways, of course. Number one, the big question right now is who's going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. Because if it's going to be a commercial car T later on, one is made by one company, one is made by another company. And let's say we collect them now when you don't need them for five years, 10 years, someone unfortunately has to pay for that. So part of this is the discussion, should we collect T cells early because they're gonna be healthier and more robust in the beginning? So it's, Michael's point is great. Let's collect them when they're really young and healthy. Who's gonna pay for it? Don't know just yet. Second is we're starting to take a look to see if we can use that stem cell bag that we collected and make mm -hmm. T cells out of it. Mm -hmm. um, that research is really in its infancy, but how cool would that be if you had stem cells collected a decade ago and we can just run it through a machine? Don't know just yet. Again, really early stuff, but those are two ways to potentially go about it. And I love that because it shows that physicians care just as much about the, you know, the outcome of the patient as the patient does. I mean, you're coming up with new innovative ways, looking at things out of the box so that we're able to make this as easy as possible for people who are affected by this disease. So it's just so rewarding to be able to have these kind of discussions. Um, Another question here about the side effects of CAR-T for people that are preparing for their procedures. Can you talk a little bit about neurotoxicity and how long does it last? Sure. So we've I mentioned a little bit about the CRS, the cytokine release syndrome. But as brought up here, there's another acronym that we call ICONS, A-C-A-N-S, Immune Effector Cell Associated Neurotoxicity Syndrome. What the hell is that? So uh, <laughs> it turns out that sometimes when you activate those T cells and they get a little crazy, they kind of drift outside of that Goldilocks zone, they can actually cross into the CNS and get into the fluid that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. Now, this is not something that probably happens a lot um, because it can be very difficult to tease out what we call low-grade icons from other things. I'll give you an example. One of the things that we see with any T cell redirector therapy is a tumor flare. So let's say you have a tumor right here and we activate your T cells and they all go right there to fight it. Well, then you've got a whole bunch of extra T cells and fluid in that space to push on the inside of the bone and you can get pain there. So that's a tumor flare. What if you have a lesion in the skull and now you get a flare because the T cells are going to attack that tumor and you get a headache. Is that headache because you're in the hospital and your neighbor's snoring and you have a headache? Could it be because you have a tumor flare? Could it be because you didn't have your coffee because hospital coffee sucks? Could it be that you're having early signs of neurotoxicity? So a lot of this is hard to tease out in that setting. So low grade um, neurotoxicity could be as simple as I'm a little tired, I have a little headache. Um, when it gets more high grade, 
you can become sleepy, even confused. And it actually turns out one of the best ways to predict early neurotoxicity is through things called micrographia and dysgraphia. As this starts to come on, your sentence writing ability not only gets worse, but it gets smaller. So when we have patients in the hospital for CAR T's, we have them pick a sentence and they write it every morning. So when we come in to see them, we say, how's your sentence? And we look, and if the sentence is getting smaller and smaller or less legible, and I could never get it because my handwriting is illegible at <laughs> the baseline, um, we start to worry, hey, maybe it's starting to come on. Um, typically we can give anti-cytokine drugs just like we do for CRS. We typically give an anti-IL-1 drug called anakinra, or we can give high doses of steroids. Both of these help to quiet down neurotoxicity. In rare, 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 rare cases, it doesn't just go away. There have been a few reported cases of Parkinsonism, where you develop Parkinson's disease as a side effect of the activated T cells from a CAR T. It's extraordinarily rare. We don't yet have a grasp of exactly who will have it, although again, it probably is, if you go into the CAR-T exploding with disease, you're probably at higher risk, uh, but that's in the extreme minority of patients. The overwhelming patients who get ICONs, it's very brief, it's low grade, and we can easily negate it with our treatment. Yeah, very well said. Thank you. Um, so many great questions here, and I apologize in advance because I don't know if we're going to get to all of them, but... Um, a couple of questions about who, again, who qualifies for these kind of treatments. First, we're going to go with those with kidney disease. Do they qualify for these bispecific or other immunotherapy treatments um, with different dose adjustments, or how does it work when they have significant kidney involvement? I love your, I love your uh, crowd. They're asking all the best questions. Yeah. Um, so that's the issue with trials. Clinical trials usually you have to have good kidneys, uh, but commercially. I can give a bispecific to someone with no kidneys or on dialysis. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of data, but you can do it. And the reason that we know that we can do it has to do with how the body breaks down antibody drugs versus how it breaks down chemotherapy drugs. And chemotherapy drugs have to oftentimes go through the kidneys. And if your kidneys aren't able to break it down, the drug will stay in your system longer and you can have side effects. Antibody drugs are usually broken down in the blood, so it's less of an issue. CAR-T, on the other hand, is a little more complex. One of the things with CAR-Ts is that once we engineer them, I can't just infuse them into you because you have what's called a T-cell repertory. You have all these different T-cells. And if I infuse the revved up ones, there's still just a voice in the crowd. You have to create immunologic space. How we do that is a few days before the CAR-T, we give you two chemotherapy drugs that kill your own T-cells to make room for the CAR-T, a drug called cytoxin and a drug called fludarabine. Now, cytoxin we use all the time in myeloma, and many myeloma patients may be familiar with it. No need for dose adjustments in renal failure. I don't care what the pharmacy says, you don't need to adjust it. It makes them happy for a 75% dose reduction, but that's another story. Fludarabine, on the other hand, is very complicated to give in renal failure. So it's been a difficult task to give patients with severe renal failure Fludarabine, and your first thing may say, well, just give them the cytoxin. That's not enough. And we've studied that. If you give cytoxin, it doesn't clear out enough space. It turns out that there's a similar drug to fludarabine called bendamustine, old German drug, that we've given to a few patients with severe renal dysfunction to safely clear out the T cells. So there's a lot of work being done on this at the moment. Number one, there was a fludarabine shortage last year. Number two, patients with renal failure still deserve the top quality care as everyone else. So there's ongoing research on how to optimally lymphodeplete, clear out that immunologic space, even if you have kidney issues, and it's probably with bendamustine. Interesting. I love to see that things are being done about that. Thank you. Um, same goes for plasma cell leukemia patients. How did they factor into this, especially with not being able to qualify for clinical trials like this? I have a patient right now in the hospital who's plasma cell leukemic. He's being discharged in the next couple of days. His next course of therapy is a CAR T. Um, commercial, the ability for drugs to be commercial means it, you know, you don't have to follow the exact same rules that you did in the clinical trial. Now, that being said, because having high burdens of disease and lots of circulating disease can put you at high risk for CRS, 
my feeling would be to take a plasma cell leukemic into a CAR T or a bispecific when their disease is not out of control, but give them something to knock it down. And before right. it has a chance to come up, give them a T cell redirecting therapy so that you limit their side effects. So that's my plan with this individual. Excellent. Thank you. Um, is peripheral neuropathy usually a side effect of these immunotherapies or can it enhance already existing neuropathy? So, so far, most of these have not really shown much in the world of neuropathy. However, there have been a few that seem that they might enhance it. Elranatumab, for one, uh, in its early phases seemed to enhance some prior neuropathy, but with more study, it doesn't seem to do it all that often. Um, neuropathy is a complex issue that can ebb and flow for a variety of reasons. So if you're on a bispecific and you're having worsening neuropathy, even if I can't tell you, hey, it's due to this, we still have to find treatments to make that better. Yeah. Uh, something that we haven't discussed today, but um, Tamara's bringing this up, is high-risk disease. Um, we're getting, well, I say we, I have nothing to do with it. You guys are getting better and better at treating high-risk disease, and yet there's still so long way to go. Do you see immunotherapy helping in the efficacy of treating this high-risk disease? And currently, do we know if CAR-T or bispecifics do a better job at hitting this high-risk disease than the standard risk? Uh, rough question. So lots, yeah, um, lots to unpack there. A lot of this depends upon how you define high risk. And I know that sounds so silly and petty, but most myeloma doctors are silly and petty, myself included. Um, we have classic cytogenetic high risk. So do you have a 17P or a 1Q? Are you high risk because you're international stage three? Are you high risk because you have extra medullary disease, myeloma that's living outside of the bone marrow? Um, are you high risk because you have what we call functional high risk? Functional high risk is if your upfront therapy, the average remission is five years and you relapse after one year, it doesn't matter what your genetics are, where you live, if Jupiter's in retrograde, you're functionally high risk. So, so far, high risk still generally does worse, but we're hoping that some combination of immunotherapies will get there. In fact, there's a wonderful study that is coming to the US in the next few months called Redirect where we're taking two bispecifics, talketamab and teclistamab, and we're using them together. And the early, early data seems that this may help offset, especially people that have that extra medullary disease, the myeloma that normally has to live inside the bone marrow. When it can live outside the bone marrow, it can do whatever it wants, so it's kind of high risk. That may be one of the sequence of mixing modalities of uh, T cell redirection. That's very helpful for those with extramedullary disease. Thank you. Sure. Um, super exciting to just see. I know I keep saying this, but I, I it motivates me <laughs> to be able to be the conveyor of this information to people that are worried about it. It's just so exciting to be put in that beacon of hope, you know, in today's world where sometimes that's hard to find. Um, Mike brings up a good point of um, the paper that you showed at the very end that had just come out. Um, uh, about longer lags between the BCMA treatments. He's wondering if that is sort of showing us that a CAR-T should come first and then the bispecifics after since some patients get a durable response after CAR-T. What is your thoughts on that? So it's a, it's a wonderful question. And a lot of it is what's available and what's your disease like. So if I have someone that their disease is exploding and I can't wait for a CAR T, I'm going to give them a bispecific because it's going to start working right away. I don't have to wait for that manufacturing time. Um, if I have a CAR T ready to go, because at the moment CAR Ts are one and done and bispecifics mostly continue, I would like to give someone a CAR T first. So I think that's a reasonable thing. The other way to think about it is I think about myeloma like a chess game and I'm horrible at chess, but the people who are good at it, apart from people receiving weird kind of vibrating things to signal them, uh, for those of you who get that reference, um, kudos to you. I'm not going to explain it to those who don't because it's inappropriate. Um, it's really about thinking several moves ahead. You, I never plan a line of therapy for a patient without thinking, what am I going to do next? Or what am I going to do after that or after that? And you often have to think several moves ahead. So in my institution, 
I have the availability, luckily, that Dr. Rossi is running GPRC 5D CAR Ts. So I feel more comfortable giving someone a BCMA by specific, knowing that I can give them a non BCMA CAR T after. If in your uh, talquetamab, the non the GPRC 5D by specific, it's likely to be approved shortly. So you're going to have a GPRC 5D and a BCMA by specific and two BCMA CAR Ts. So you may say, all right, if I need to give someone urgent therapy, I'm going to give them talquetamab because I want to give them a BCMA CAR T down the road. So I, I like his thought, and he is probably right that it may be the best thing to do CAR T and then biospecific, but we don't know. And we're trying to figure out that optimal course, and that optimal course is going to be different for different people in different institutions. Um, but I, I, you know, his question is one, it's the million dollar question right now. Yeah, definitely. And you, you know, just said yourself, depends on the different people. If we've learned anything about myeloma, it's that everybody is going to respond differently. Everybody's myeloma is different, unfortunately, but what's being, what's great about sessions like these is there really is hope for everyone as these immunotherapies are really just taking off being approved, and um, there's so many more clinical trials in motion. So it's so exciting. Dr. Richter, thank you for your time. Do you have any closing statements before we finish up today? No, I just really like to thank you specifically, Audrey, uh, and Health Tree for putting on these wonderful programs that really connect everyone. Um, I think it's something special about the myeloma world that we're able to interact like this and all share ideas and and you brought up a great point. This came because someone asked a question like this in a previous one. So, you know, keeping the conversation going, all work, all pushing in the same direction towards cure. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time. <laughs> We're going to finish up here um, with just a couple of outro announcements. So if you want to join this chapter again, we're going to be meeting on June 21st. We meet every other month. And somehow that means that the next time we meet is already in June, halfway through the year. I can't even believe it, how fast time is going. But we will be talking about probing the immune micro environment one cell at a time. It's single cell sequencing with Dr. David Coffey. And I'm really looking forward to this. It's extremely innovative really exciting and he explains it very articulate artic i can't explain it articulately but you guys know what i'm trying to say here um please join us we will send you the link when that event is available to register for more upcoming events that you might be interested in we do have the nutrition and wellness for myeloma chapter tomorrow night we're going to be talking about organic versus non-organic what myeloma patients and care partners need to know the 13th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern is our Northeast chapter. So if you live anywhere from Maine all the way to Delaware, make sure to join us. We're going to be discussing living your full range of emotions during your myeloma journey. And then the 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern is our myeloma caregiver chapter. We're going to be discussing um, the caregiver role post stem cell transplant and uh, just how do you prepare for that, I guess, also. Um, what's your role during it and what's your role after it. So please join us for any of those events or even more events that I haven't mentioned. The link is found at the bottom of the slide and will be included in our follow-up email. Uh, thank you so much to our sponsors, Amgen, Genentech, Adaptive, Janssen, and Abby. But thank you most of all to each of you for helping us build this community, for asking amazing questions and providing for an excellent discussion. I couldn't do it without you. And I thank each of you. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.